Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel um, in the afternoon. It's been an excellent, excellent two days of panels and discussions here with a lot of different topics being covered. Um, I don't know how much the those present today are familiar with the political hap goings on in the Western Balkans in general. Um, I'm lucky to be a moderator with a panel of such extraordinary experts, so you're all in great hands um, with regards to that. But before we start, just a brief, um, I think it'd be great if, just, if I just gave a brief overview of recent events in the Western Balkans that I think the panelists are going to be mentioning, and that could be relevant uh, as we talk about Russian influence, but especially in the context of um, EU enlargement. So unlike H Hungary, um, many countries in the Western Balkans are still on their EU integration are still on their, thank you for that, um, on the, are still on their EU integration um, paths, which means that they're part of this, of a process started with the end of the, conf more or less with the end of the conflicts in, um, th that happened with the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, but formalized in, in Thessaloniki in 2003. And this was, you know, this was before the, inva the first invasion of Ukraine, before many different events took place in the world and on the continent, where the European Union was much more optimistic about the way, uh, first of all, about expansion, but also, so including new members, but also about the way in which it would influence these countries. Um, there was this euphoria that was part of this process where the EU believed that it could be as thorough as possible um, in reforming these post-conflict countries and um, bringing them within within the loop um, of, of the EU. Precisely because of this investment by the EU, or this interest by the EU, from the early days, perhaps not early 2000s, the, the Russia's government at the time was a different in a different state of mind, but pretty early on there was an interest on the side of Russia to influence these processes or to influence the Balkans, the Western Balkans, away from the EU. And this is a process that has had been fluctuating in intensity depending on Russia's own foreign policy goals. And now we're at a time where Russia is distracted or more focused, let's say, on, on the uh, brutal invasion of Ukraine and other you know, uh, global hotspots that have appeared since then. But it still is a ma major concern for all these countries and, and, and our esteemed panelists will be explaining this in detail. I will start with uh, Goran Buldyowski, who can explain sort of what types of Russian influence exist in the region, um, perhaps, and, and give, give the audience more of an, uh, a background on, on where we stand with us right now. Uh, thank you, and pleasure to be here. Uh, really grateful to be in what was a sister institution when we were here uh, uh, in Budapest a few, year, a few years ago. So um, there's a lot to unpack here. And obviously, because we had a, we had a panel talking about disinformation, one of the champions uh, uh, around the globe is obviously Russia. But I, I, I exactly because we had that panel, I would like to bring all of us uh, a bit of in, a, in a different terrain. And that is the terrain of really look what are the different pathways of influence that Russia has. And actually, when you look at the situation, I will also try to come up, not necessarily because I, I'm, I'm an incurable optimist, but actually with a more uh, cheerful picture than usually we would come on this subject. So uh, first, uh, I will go away from um, a, a bit more sophisticated frameworks that you have, uh, you know, soft, hard, uh, sharp power, but then I will spend my seven minutes to explain them all. Uh, let's, let's talk about Russia as a diplomat, Russia as an investor, and Russia as a meddler. And the first point, Russia as a diplomat, actually brings after, in the aftermath of the uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, um, of their full-scale invasion on Ukraine, actually relatively good news. Except in the corridors of UN, where Russia still wields certain power as a permanent member uh, of, uh, of the UN Security Council, actually, Russia is not present as an actor, not even around the table, but even in the room outside of that table on any of the issues, be that Serbia, Kosovo, be that uh, issues around Bulgaria, uh, North Macedonia, and whatnot. Doesn't mean that that, that doesn't meddle and interfere, but formally, in the formal space, is not there. Second, Russia is an investor. Now, I'll speak about illicit 
investor. That's much more potent. But Russia as a formal investor in the Balkans uh, has been already going down on a pathway down uh, even before the invasion on Ukraine. So actually already by 2019 the investments were down and for example just to give you an illustration in Montenegro uh, it used to be up to 20 percent. But the times where uh, oligarchs and billionaires like Oleg Deripaska were investing left, right, and center, I mean, in Montenegro in this case, and some others, are gone. It doesn't mean that Russia does not have some strategic assets. It does, it's particularly in the energy sector. It doesn't mean that Russia will not do that. But actually, because it's overstretched, as a formal investor, Russian's influence has really dwindled in the Balkans. Now we come to the third one, where we talk about disinformation. I know, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about that because my colleagues uh, here in the panel are much more knowledgeable. I will talk more about the context against this happens. First, it's important to think uh, uh, rather in the term of meddler, because others have defined much, much better this also. It, it's not only about the disinformation space. It's also about illicit finance that goes in the political system, meaning funding and bribing uh, legally, half legally, illegally political parties, um, then actually really uh, flooding the information space and abusing and, and creating a narratives. And then last but not least, it has been tried, and luckily with not a great success, also using political violence, uh, such as the alleged uh, coup in, in, in Montenegro and a couple of other isolated cases. So this is like in the, in the toolkit. And here the picture is a bit mixed. So, Really, if we, go, um, if we go through the different countries, I, I, I mentioned Montenegro. Once Montenegro was in NATO, you could see immediately, even if there are different actors, even some are pro-Russian, you can see that actually how much there is uh, limited influence to deal with that. Um, same goes with, uh, for example, North Macedonia. Um, I think Albania and Kosovo are pretty much off the charts, which makes it a very interesting divide um, inside, inside the region. Uh, where, of course, the issue is very, very potent and still actual, that's in Serbia, that's with Serbian minorities and communities outside, and also all of those countries that consume news that are produced in Belgrade. And they have a very, very significant thing. I, I, let me take, I, I, I come from North Macedonia. Let me take North Macedonia as an example because it's a, it's, a really, it's a really good case where actually you will see an, from 2008 and a massive increase of influence and it coincides with Macedonia not being accepted in NATO. Uh, a long name dispute, and then basically uh, fills the pattern. You have a, a problem which is not necessarily Russian or not caused by Russia, but a potent problem that could be used, and then you have a massive influx of, of intervention. And then the pattern goes. Every problem that you have, we, be it, there's a negotiation about the name and changing the name, press my ag agreement. Be that now, up till today, the, today, basically constitutional crisis, you see the same narratives going there. Now, what's in, interesting about this is that Russia, um, um, in some ways, there's some always the pro-Russian over, uh, uh, overtones and undertones, but actually it serves a lot of potent narratives that are consumed locally. Uh, in this case, actually, what I would like to emphasize, um, it very nicely marries together with Serbian nationalism. And probably one does not explain too much. I mean, Serbia is not so far away. You have a lot of pictures between the leaders of this country and that country. But it's very interesting how that actually marriages. And then that's actually also my point. Now, I, when, even we see a, a, not a recession, but simply the volume of activities cannot be maintained, Almost uh, the local, uh, some of the local leaders do not, n they don't need Russia, or they would rather invent it as a meddler because they need it and they perpetuate it itself. Because some of those narratives, whether it's pro Russian and whatnot, would be peddled even just for the interest of. I mean, I use Serbian nationalism as the most obvious, but let's say when we go in Macedonia, um, it's a good example where you have marginal players, uh, a very small party that is not even part of the parliament, but is able to splurt narratives. Party Levica, that nominally is a left-leaning, but basically living in, uh, out of, uh, of Russian money, uh, uh, in the parliament, minority player, but again, very important influencer. And I think we go into that 
And, and I would like to conclude, in a way, what today Russia tells us is rather more speaking about the weaknesses uh, of the approach by, let's say, the West. I mean, this means European Union and the United States, first and foremost, because, interestingly enough, uh, uh, some of those uh, interventions also have, maybe they have not bought in the narrative, but they operate as if the narrative is so strong. And, uh, there is no bigger example than the current debate of how much, you know, not only that Serbia is in the center, but how much one has to curb Serbian nationalism, Serbian narratives, in order to to build stability uh, in the in the region. So I will I'll stop at that. I, I probably put a lot of things, but counting that my role was more to set the ground, and colleagues will fill in with uh, with a lot of uh, insight ins uh, in insightful details. Thank you. No, that was excellent, Goran, because I think you're getting, we, you got very quickly to the heart of the issue. We only have one hour. I think all of us could talk about this for, an ex for extended periods of time. But one thing that you mentioned as a trend, both with North Macedonia, Serbia, and other places, is that Russia has, over the years, been very good at using existing ethnic cleavages, political cleavages, even ideological cleavages that exist in the Balkans, whether they're, you know, uh, wh whether it's Serbian nationalism in in, in uh, Serbia and places that um, in the region such as Montenegro or Bosnia that have a significant uh, Serbian minority or um, ethnic group, or whether it's uh, you know opposition po uh, parties such as the left wing party in North Macedonia and even the former ruling party, which sometimes engages um, uh, sometimes engages in pro-Russian narratives. I think this is a perfect segue to Anton, who has not, of course, his, his work needs, Anton Shekotso's work needs no introduction, but specifically, I think you can make a, a great connection between the way narratives, uh, Russian disinfo narratives, narratives and malign narratives are used both, you know, in the speeches made by Kremlin leaders and so on and so forth, but also online and, and how this connection is formed, especially with countries like Serbia. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers as well for the uh, for for this invitation. I will focus on Serbia, and I um, I want to start with a, almost a personal note, or uh, because one of the people involved in the case that I'm uh, I want to start with uh, is a friend, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, uh, who is now jailed in Russia for I think he got even more than Alexei Navalny, um, and. In, in, in mid-May 2021, um, Interior Minister of Serbia, Alexander Vulin, uh, went to Russia and met with um, Nikolai Patrushev. He's uh, currently the head of the intelligence agency, which is even yes, worse, but Alexander. At that time, he was, uh, he was still uh, the Interior Minister, and he went to see uh, uh, Russian, um, uh, the Secretary of the National Security Council, Nikolai Patrushev, also one of the of the major, you know, um, major figures in the Russian intelligence, counterintelligence, um, and um, they, of course, discussed the uh, the future of Serbian-Russian relations. Alexander Vulin uh, said that definitely um, Serbia would not introduce sanctions against Russia. They are not going to take part in this, uh, as he said, hysteria, uh, anti-Russian hysteria. Mm -hmm and uh, Serbia would remain militarily neutral. Uh, what, he meant, uh, what, what he, they did not report, at least officially, and, uh, and this is something that one Serbian newspaper reported, that during the same visit, Alexandra Vulin also brought tapes uh, of, the, of the meeting uh, that was held by Russian opposition activists in Belgrade and was apparently wiretapped by the Serbian security services. Uh, I'm sure that actually Russians probably did not even ask to do that, but they did, they did this on their own volition, and they brought those tapes to, uh, to, uh, to Russia and gave that to Padrashev. And uh, two people who were involved in, those, in that meeting, I'm, I'm sure they did not discuss anything uh, really violent or revolution in Russia. Uh, if you, some of you are familiar with the Russian opposition forces, uh, they are not really violent types. Uh, um, so, uh, and they were arrested. Uh, Andrei Pivovarov, uh, a Russian opposition activist, he was, he was arrested two weeks after after that particular incident, and uh, Vladimir Karomurza, whom I mentioned, he was arrested uh, the next year. Uh, but 
this is just to show you what 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 country yeah or what political establishment we are dealing with but uh, serbia in my opinion it remains one of the most pro russian countries uh, among other western balkan countries but despite this fact uh, that it's essentially very very pro russian russia still maintains its own malign influence operations there. And uh, I especially want to um, highlight three areas where I think that Russian influence is particularly strong or at least significant. Uh, one area is the um, energy policies, energy politics. Uh, another area is socio-political initiatives and then the media space. So let me start with um, energy policies. Uh, the Russian energy presence uh, has been very strong in Serbia since 1992. But in 2007, uh, during the second presidential term of Vladimir Putin, he essentially started even um, a more actively, more actively um, uh, promote investments, Russian investments in Serbian uh, infrastructure uh, uh, related to the energy sector. And uh, partly it was because he and the Kremlin, uh, as such, the, the Russian elites wanted to uh, put pressure on Ukraine. Uh, because also Ukraine was also a very, uh, very important, um, 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 Ukrainian infrastructure was also very important in transporting energy supplies, uh, oil and gas, especially gas. Uh, from Russia to Europe. So, in order to put pressure on, on Ukraine, that it's not a sole, uh, it's not a sole, and transfer country. So that was behind the, uh, at least partly behind the agenda of the so-called Kremlin uh, energy offensive in the Western Balkans and Serbia, especially. Um, Serbia has been almost totally dependent on uh, Russian energy supplies for a very long time. Uh, but I must say that in recent months, uh, Serbia um, did some, there is some sort of um, modification uh, in, these, in, these, in the Serbian approaches towards Russian energy supplies. Uh, although, as you may imagine, this long dependence on Russian energy supplies created a network on both sides of people who have vested interests in actually maintaining Serbia's um, dependency on the Russian gas supply. With Russia, I think it's understandable, yes, they want this, but also in Serbia itself, there are people who want Serbia to remain uh, dependent, almost totally dependent on Russian energy supplies. So this is about, uh, briefly about energy policy. Socio-cultural sphere. Uh, Russia maintains a wide range of online and offline initiatives in Serbia that are often operated by the Russian diplomatic staff. Um, these initiatives operate in a uh, favorable um, opinion climate and use various tools and organizations, including the Orthodox Church, uh, to fuel Serbian grievances against the West, um, to prevent Serbia's closer cooperation with uh, the EU and NATO. Uh, they manipulate historical narratives, uh, they try to promote so-called traditional values and um, conservative attitudes or ultra-conservative attitudes in uh, Serbia. And there is, a, there is a growing number of those initiatives. Again, I'm, I'm circling back to what I said, despite the fact that Serbia is already one of well, the most pro-Russian country in the Western Balkans. The, the number of those initiatives is growing. And uh, again, uh, anti, mostly anti-Western, uh, anti-EU uh, narratives. This is what they are spreading. And of course, the, uh, um, another narrative, what the, the anti-American or anti-Western narrative, these are sort of negative, uh, negative narratives. Uh, and the, the only positive uh, uh, narrative here is that uh, Russia, as an older brother of Serbia, is always there to help Serbia, to support Serbia, unlike the treacherous West. And then the media, the media space. This is, this is, this is actually quite interesting. So, uh, two major outlets, media outlets of, uh, of the Russian Federation, controlled and, uh, and sponsored by the Russian state, are present in uh, Serbia. This is uh, uh, Sputnik Serbia. 
and uh, now RT Balkan. And RT, um, RT Balkan, this is the uh, um, addition of RT, formerly known as Russia Today, uh, that, was, that was launched in 2022. And that was not, uh, that was actually quite interesting because it was also the year when RT was blocked in the EU. Yeah? And the same year they launched, and quite successfully, the website of R R RT Balkan. And this Sputnik Serbia and RT Balkan, uh, it's, almost a uh, it's almost a family business. Because our t uh, Sputnik Serbia is, um, the, the, its editor-in-chief is, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Lubinka Mil uh, Milicic. Uh, oh, sorry, Milicic. And uh, her daughter is the editor-in-chief of RT Balkan. So it's really like a, f a family business. What's interesting about those, um, uh, those media initiatives and media projects is that there is th their budgets are huge. A really huge budget, um, but at the same time, and also there is a keen interest in Russia in the developments uh, around Russia and in, in Russia in the in the Serbian society. But um, there is these media; they they are so they are obviously Russian, uh, despite the fact that again. Uh, Serbian, Serbian nationals are editing or are editors in chief of those media projects. Nevertheless, m uh, many stories, news stories, are produced, are written by Russians, and who very often lack um, knowledge of what is going on locally. So th sometimes they are not in this uh, in this context. They cannot be considered as really ser authentically, you know, Serbian uh, Serbian media. So they have this. It's almost like a in a way ghetto uh, for them. Uh, they they are so obviously pro, not only pro-Russian, but they act or they are perceived, are seen in Serbia as essentially mouthpieces of the Kremlin, yeah? Uh, although in, in some other countries, RT is being more, um, more creative. They do try to involve as many local journalists as possible, so RT or Sputnik would look like a really authentic uh, media outlet. This is not the same uh, with, uh, with these uh, Russian media in Serbia. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, these media, they remain important uh, references for the for the Kremlin's positions on various issues on on Ukraine on what is happening in the Balkans what is happening in Russia um, it, it in my opinion it remains to be seen whether um, I think uh, Goran will agree with me that uh, many Western Balkan politicians but also Serbian politicians are uh, in a way quite pragmatic so um, if they at some point decide to take a more pro-European turn, uh, maybe they will do something about this Russian influence, but actually I think that if Russia maintains this uh, influence as it has today uh, in the r uh, wide range of areas, starting with, uh, with the media but also with the energy policies, um, maybe these dem pro-democratic developments will not be that easy. Even, even if, if Serbian politicians would like to go in that direction. And in the end, I want to stress that, um, uh, especially since the start of the, of the um, as Ukrainians call it, big war, uh, Russian big war uh, uh, against Ukraine in February 2022, uh, Moscow aims, of course, even more aggressively to block the EU integration of Serbia, uh, in, in particular, but also in general, uh, Western Balkan countries, uh, integration into the EU. And it does so not only through uh, socio-political, uh, socio-cultural initiatives, not only media, not only uh, uh, weaponization of energy policies, but also through attempts, uh, as uh, Una mentioned, attempts to uh, escalate ethnic and religious tensions, uh, already existing conflicts uh, in the Western Balkans and in Serbia in particular, using radicals, using extremists, ultra-nationalists. And um, of course, uh, Russia is not offering any new or any alternative security or economic framework 
for the Western Balkans in general and in Serbia in particular. It only in, it's only interested in you know, destabilizing the region. Uh, it is very uh, important a region for Russia uh, specifically because it, it feels that uh, the, Balkan, the Balkan region has a, uh, a significant geopolitical position and it wants to uh, still take control over the tensions that they may arise or may be um, may go down but the the ability to control the tensions this is what russia is very much interested in and this is why it is still increasing or trying to increase its present um, formally and uh, even informally even illegally and illicitly in in the region thank you thank you that was very extensive um, I'd just like to add an anecdote to your, I'm glad you mentioned Sputnik um, and, and, and Russia, RT Balkans. Um, so when RT Balkans was set up, we, we were all very worried because, um, you know, this was right after the full scale invasion and, and why was there a new drive to, you, you had Sputnik, you had a lot of um, Serbian pro-government television was initially reporting on the invasion in a largely not not not, not ev evidently but a largely pro pro uh, russian uh, way and so on and so forth and we were like why do they need it um rt balkans and, and they did hire uh, initially a slew of editors which were like very high profile um sort of serbian national some of them nationalists some of them less so journalists and um so it, it's as you said it has it had a certain level level of success but um one thing that was really funny a couple of months ago or a month or so ago they had because you said that they, the 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 stories that are written by the russian journalists or that come in from russia are not edited to serve the serbian context context so they were merely being translated and there were we you know, eagle-eyed eagle independent Serbian journalists caught a lot of articles where um, when they were referring to ministries or organs or governments, they said, our government, referring to the Kremlin, and our special operation, and our, which, you know, very, you, you assume that influence operations would be slightly more sophisticated. Um, we'll get back to you, uh, Goran, uh, sorry, Anton, with, with several um, questions. Or actually, let's do this right now, very briefly. You know. I think it would be fair to say that one of the main talking points that um, Russia uses when it comes, Putin himself uses when it comes to the Balkans relates to Kosovo and comparing Kosovo to Crimea and, and the uh, annexation of Donetsk and Luhansk. If you could just briefly touch upon that for people who might not be familiar, why this is such an important talking point for him. Well, uh, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question uh, because um, I think we, we don't really know what's going on in the head of Vladimir Putin. But uh, I think that for for Russia, the the the, the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia was a very crucial historical moment. I think this is where this um, uh, optimism uh, or optimistic views of the West was a little bit broken in Russia. So this whole Kosovo thing, I think that many Russians actually, they associated Serbia, Serbia with Russia. And the fear, I think, was that so if NATO can do this to Serbia, they can do this to us. And um, because, because of, the, of how it all ended with the independence of Kosovo, um, I think for, for Vladimir Putin, with his uh, very Soviet uh, tradition of whataboutism, uh, whataboutism, uh, um, I'm sure many of you know, is that is the, the, the Soviet tradition when, when Americans or Western uh, observers criticize the Soviet Union, or cri used to criticize the Soviet Union uh, for some you know, for human rights violations, the, uh, the, the, the response of the Soviets would be, but what about problems in America? Uh, what about the what about slavery or what about you know how you treat uh, black people? And so the, what aboutism? So what about? So it, for him it was I think even a natural uh, a knee jerk reaction to all the criticism against uh, of uh, criticism of the annexation of Crimea and the, the parallel that he has yeah but what about Kosovo you know. It was the uh, violent. Uh, um, it was violence. It was uh, uh, an invasion, or, or not invasion, but uh, uh, attack on on a sovereign country, Yugoslavia. Um, 
So if you, if you can do this, why can't we? It, it's a double standard. So this is the play that he's playing. Yeah, I mean, just uh, it, is, it is an important talking point that comes up. And a perfect segue to Tanya, um, who, which, you know, another country uh, that Tanya knows very well is, is obviously Bosnia and Herzegovina, where there is, has been a different form of Russian influence. Um, uh, current Bosnian political leader, uh, Bosnian uh, Republic, yes, entity leader. Um, uh, Bosnia has two political entities, each have a parliament, a government, and, and, and so on and so forth. So not get into the details of that. Um, but uh, he's a leader of the Serb majority entity right now, was previously a part of the um, presidency, the national presidency, or the three member presidency of Bosnia, Milorad Dodik. But he has been, you know, he was one of the people who days after the invasion was the first person to call Lavrov and to talk to him about how you know, he, he, he had his support and if you could talk about how you know, Russian influences looked like in Bosnia over the years. Sure, thank you and uh, thank you Una for your kind of like a, uh, overview of the situation because I, I think uh, it doesn't get discussed outside of the Western Balkans so we are now uh, in Hungary and it's quite lovely and I would be also remiss if I didn't mention the fact that uh, to me it's quite personal uh, to be back at Nadorutsa 15 as a proud CU alumni. I'm, I'm really honored to be invited to the event and to be here and see some of my former professors here. It's quite thrilling to me. But back to Bosnia and uh, Una, um, it doesn't come as a surprise that, the, that what you were trying to explain the rules that the current, uh, the current uh, or uh, ongoing leader of the governing party in the RS, it's a mouthful. When you talk about Bosnia political system, it's a mouthful. Uh, uh, explaining the political system, explaining the dynamics, uh, the competences, it's, it's a lot. And, and there's, uh, coming from Washington DC, there's a certain level of fatigue when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, which personally uh, pains me, uh, but professionally I'm completely in, in alignment with that assessment because Bosnia is an old story, however, is a current spoiler. And when we talk about the, the foreign malign influence and Russian, if it be, um, I think the, in, in general, any malign influence in a country is really dependent upon two things. One is the structural vulnerabilities, which Bosnia is in, in uh, abundance of. And the second one is the willingness or um, indigenous kind of uh, uh, willingness to be a proxy or a willing client and a partner to that same influence. And I think Russia, in in case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, has both. Um, and there are a couple of sectors that Anton and Garin had already touched upon, um, and and we've been observing uh, through uh, civil society and, and the media uh, organizations that we support. What are the trends and how the uh, the evolution of the Russian influence in Bosnia? And obviously, one is the disinformation. Uh, I'm not going to belabor that. We, we heard the panelists uh, previously, and, and Anton and, and Goran had already touched upon it. But it is important in the Bosnian context, because Bosnia is in this perpetual uh, electoral cycle. Uh, the, the elections in Bosnia, they alternate every two years from general to local. So the kind of like campaigning never really ends. And when we, when we speak about disinformation, a lot of our grantees and civil society alike had noted that a lot of the portals that are completely spoiling Russia propaganda are popping up just before the elections and are then disappearing. And then there's a very, it's very hard to track and to follow the, the kind of like the, the order of, of their appearance and their effect. The second area that I, I would like to discuss is energy, but unlike in Serbia, um, uh, the RS leadership had been pursuing this um, willingness to, um, to be dependent on Gazprom for a long time. And uh, just as we talk, uh, RS prime minister and two ministers, one of commerce and one of energy, are visiting Russia to discuss the, what they called, I believe, new eastern connection, uh, which is the new gas line um, through Bielina, through the uh, northeast, um, running from Serbia to, uh, to Bosnia, that would further um, uh, make the country dependent on, 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 the, uh, on the gas and the energy resource when the entire EU and, and everybody else is trying to move away from that, uh, seeing how it really depends on the whim of a one man to cut off the um, entire nation of the gas in, in a critical winter. So there's that, and there are pr there are really there's evidence out there, and it's all everything. I, I say it's really publicly available, um, and our and, and civil society has been pretty vocal about it. But it's dangerous. Third sector is really security, and um, unlike many countries in the region, Bosnia and Herzegovina doesn't have a single national security strategy, rather where which encompasses all security threats. 
being from corruption to foreign malign influence to terrorism, far right. Um, these are all kind of sp sporadically mentioned in various uh, levels, um, in various documents. I mean, at some point we have to explain the political system in Bosnia or nobody's going to understand. No, but very briefly, if I may just interrupt you, you know, Bosnian, the Bosnian post-war order was the Dayton Agreement, which was signed as both to end the fighting but also set up the post-war uh, um, political order, is one of the most complex constitutions in the world, which means that it, um, I'm jumping in as a journalist who's had to explain this several times throughout her life, so you're going to have to suffer through me, suffer through it with me. But, you know, it has, it was meant to be a political system that protected every single ethnic group at every single level, from like the very local municipal ones to the can cantonal ones, to the, uh, the entity ones, to the and I'm going to miss a level and so on and so forth, but it has a multiply, it multiplied levels of power, which makes it easy to manipulate. If you have someone who's a negative, you know, wants to be a negative uh, sort of influence on this, and, and, and Milora Dodik and, and the Republika Srpska has been using this quite extensively. I mean, you, you said it. I no, I was just explaining I, the background because some people I'm might not know. Maybe I'm just that um, the, the highly decentralized nature of the governing makes governing almost virtually impossible. And also, th this is why the country is in a constant debate over its geopolitical kind of orientation. But going back to security, which is what concerns me, not only as, as somebody who works in the space, but also as a Bosnian who has a family and friends there, um, not having a single document that governs that space is very dangerous. And uh, especially when you have militarized parades organized every January and when you have, you know, organized uh, crime ties with political elites who are somehow connected with the Russian uh, motorbike uh, uh, groups. Night that, wolves, yes. That you had written about. And then also when you have, with the case of North Macedonia, when there was a wave of kind of expelling and, and declaring personas non gratas of the Russian uh, quote to quote diplomats, uh, when North Macedonia qu uh, puts it kind of diplomatically saying they weren't really uh, acting according to the Vienna Convention on, on Diplomacy, uh, these people were expelled and somehow they find their ways accredited in Bosnia and Herzegovina. These are all security um, security risks. So whether it's a huge negligence or incompetence or just an um, uh, intentional uh, issue, it, it, it kind of gives me creeps. And finally, uh, 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 on where Russia in particular has kind of like a, a very different, um, I would say, uh, influence, uh, unlike in any other countries, is that a codified, what we're seeing this year in 2023, a codified attempt to silence dissent. Uh, earlier in the year, um, uh, the RS uh, uh, National Assembly had adopted um, so-called defamation law, criminalizing defamation. Um, 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 a number of civil society groups had uh, kind of uh, submitted requests for constitutionality of the law. Um, as we talk right now, uh, we have uh, another, um, uh, another draft law uh, uh, in the procedure, uh, so-called foreign agent law, the, 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 the civil society had, had mentioned and had analyzed that it's a word for word uh, Russian, uh, modeled after Russian foreign agent law. And then there's probably um, and, uh, a third law in the working. So you, you have a codified um, uh, a way of actually silencing any, uh, any opposition or criticism which is modeled after, after Kremlin. I'll yeah, exactly. Here. No, the Dodik wants to implement its own his own foreign agent law. That that kind of stuff isn't isn't unfamiliar to those who follow um, events in Russia and elsewhere. Um, Shiga, I'm so sorry you had to wait so long to 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 uh, say no something. No problem. And you you have the un sort of slightly difficult task of sort of taking everything that's been said and explaining how that affects the EU integration process. Because you know, if I could just briefly interject, you know, they. The EU is very heavily involved in the reform processes in the region, yet this Russian influence persists and it exists in one way or another. And or, like Tanya said, Russia similar or like policies that are inspired by Russia keep, you know, cropping up in places like like um, uh, Bosnia, but also Montenegro and some, to some extent issues with, with um, you know, uh, religious authorities and divisions and stuff like that. So, so how, how is the EU trying to handle this and what does that mean? All right, so I'll try to do my best and wrap everything together and add it, you know, a European perspective. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing this conference uh, and it's a real pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, I thought at the first that actually I'll start at the 
you know, current events and what's happening on the EU level. But after all these interventions, I feel like I should kind of, you know, follow this path, talking a bit more about the Western Balkans first, and what actually happened in the past 10, 15 years uh, on the EU, uh, European integrational process of those uh, Western Balkan countries. So, I mean, there has been a lot said about the role of Serbia, uh, and I'll just uh, add to everything that Goran, Anton, but also Tanya mentioned. Uh, you know, a lot of roads go down to Belgrade when it comes to the path of most of the Western Balkan countries on its European journey. Uh, Serbia affects uh, basically directly, obviously, the situation and the future of Kosovo. It affects the future of Bosnia through the Republika Srpska and the connections with Dodik and all the others around. Uh, it affects, to a certain extent, uh, the situation in Montenegro uh, with the current political crisis that we've seen in the past couple of years and the influence of the Serb population in Montenegro on you know, where the country should be heading. And of course, uh, last but not least, it affects Serbia on its own. Uh, at the current situation, when looking uh, at the EU enlargement policy, its normative power, the you know aspects of democratization that it offers, uh, I believe this vision kind of faded away in the past, you know, seven eight years. Basically, from when Juncker taking over the European Commission in 2014 said there will be no enlargement during my mandate. This was a big boomer for a lot of countries in the Western Balkans because it meant that no matter how they perform, they will not be let in anytime soon. Which obviously, you know, if we look at the nature of Balkan people, they're, I think, very welcoming, but also very frank, very direct. And, you know, they don't like to be lied to. And this wording of Juncker at that time really kind of went against everything that was promised from 2003, from Thessaloniki summit, to up until 2014 to some of the Western Balkan countries. So from then on, we actually started seeing this fatigue of the European enlargement, I mean, EU enlargement policy towards the Western Balkans. We've seen French veto, a new methodology, Bulgarian veto towards the uh, North Macedonia, and all of this added up to a uh, perception within the Western Balkans that uh, the EU actually doesn't want us to be part of it, one way or another. Uh, at the current situation where we are now, we have this new momentum caused by the Russian war in Ukraine, caused by granting the candidacy status to Ukraine and Moldova, two countries that are performing very fast. And although they're at the bottom of the race now, given the political will and the support also from the side of the EU, but more broadly, Western uh, democracies, you know, they can outperform the Western Balkan countries very fast, which actually even adds up to this frustration and distrust to some of the people towards what the European project is about. So now, at the current situation, I'll try to be brief of, on what we should do to change these things around, to make the enlargement policy work for the Western Balkans again, and what are the risks of you know, not succeeding in this. So uh, first and foremost, it's obvious that enlargement is back on the table. It is a political priority now for, I would say, most of the EU member states. For a long time, this was not the case. For a long time, there were member states within the EU that were basically against any further enlargement, and there were countries that didn't really care about it. Now it turned from this democratizational economic ties to the region to the security aspects, and the EU understands that enlargement has to happen to actually, you know, balance uh, the influences in the region, and obviously to protect the region from the malign influence Russia, but also of China, Turkey, Saudis, all the others. China would be, a, oh, sorry, China would be a completely different panel. We're barely going to get to cover. I'm not <laughs> going there. Don't worry. So uh, now, first and foremost, what has to really happen is that the EU really commits to this, 
not only by you know some uh, statements of the politicians and representatives of the EU, but also to setting enlargement as a strategic priority for the next commission. So this is something in the making for the upcoming year. Uh, it has to start discussing about if we get all these countries in, and I'm not talking just about the Western Balkans now, but Ukraine and Moldova, obviously, it's a bit of a different process. What uh, the you know, financial framework of the EU will look like in the future. We have to already now, if we're serious about enlarging, we have to count with the numbers of a EU 30 plus. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, we have to still maintain obviously the merit-based process. We have to stick to the criteria that are set up, but make it work faster, more efficient, and uh, we have to make the EU more engaged in the region. Uh, because if this somehow doesn't happen in the upcoming few years, I'm really worried that we're risking even bigger fatigue, which effectively can completely block the EU enlargement policy in the future. And I'm not even opening the questions connected to Ukraine, its size, country at war, and stuff like that. So I'll try to stop here, I guess, because I guess we don't have much time left. Yeah. And I'll be happy to answer any of the follow-ups. Um, I just go to Goran first for responses. I saw you feverishly taking notes. Uh, well, how would you respond to everything that's been said so far? What what hasn't been covered? I mean, no. I, I first uh, I would like to get a uh, you know a sense of how much will cost. Uh, Western Balkans is the economy of Slovakia or the economy of city of Munich. You choose small. Uh, uh, if Western Balkans was added to the bill of European Union that will cost between 1.60 euros to 10 euros 80 per capita per EU citizen at the moment. So literally, I mean, like, where's the 10 euros? I think even in Hungary or 3,800 foreigners and counting, uh, you can put it on the table and say, okay, at least let's not have a headache. Let's, go, let's not have another debate uh, about the Balkans. But it's more complicated than that. And let me actually focus on why it's complicated and why Hungary, uh, why it's interesting for you. Uh, all of the things that we talked, actually, Hungary can learn about. Uh, colleagues mentioned uh, the security aspects. They're actually serious. I love Andrzej Street. But there is one part where I always wonder how many floors have been decked down under Andrzej next to the oldest metro in continental Europe uh, in the Russian embassy because the number of Russian embassy staff is increasing every single day. And I think a learning point from the Balkans is that that's not very healthy, even these are your best friends. And if you, if you don't trust me, then probably Mr. Orban should ask Mr. Vucic. And I think that's a very important point, uh, and we're counting over 500 here. Uh, it's actually unprecedented. Uh, it's even for the Balkan numbers quite impressive. Second thing, actually, Hungary mattered quite a lot. Uh, the EU commissioner was appointing Hungarian because at the time it was considered by the Germans that it's totally relevant. Let's give a ministry where there will be no harm done. Uh, and uh, in order to wake up in today's world where actually you have Dodik going to Moscow, taking nice photos, coming back and taking nice photos with whom? With Oliver Varhe. Uh, and actually it becomes now an issue because in, the, in this particular commission you have a commissioner that cannot do this. And that's not unimportant in a bureaucracy that actually wants to show that this is a technocratic process. Last thing which is important about Hungary in terms of this everyday sort of functioning thing in political world is also security threat. E even that nothing can compare with what we witness now, the horrors of Ukraine, having a, another uh, sort of conflict, even if it's a low intensity conflict on your southern border, you don't want to have. Uh, as, as simple as it is. Last point, uh, a lot of colleagues that deal with this staged accession, a lot, uh, uh, the various modalities of countries entering into the EU without having a vote. We forget that all the Central and Eastern European states, all mid-sized countries really watch at this, irrespectively whether they're run by people with authoritarian tendencies, as here, or more democratic setup uh, as somewhere else. Why? Because they are really afraid that if you have 
tiered membership for the Balkan countries, that's one step to the vision of multiple speed Europe, where actually next in the row will be the Hungarys, the Czech Republics, the Slovaks of this world to be in, slotted into that. And that's not actually a technocratic discussion, it's a very political discussion, it's not a naive discussion. And I think it's important that in Budapest also people who are progressive at it. Uh, sorry, I said uh, I, I, I like to talk about money, so let me just put one thing. Um, no, the, the, the point is we talked a lot about energy, we talked about the smaller Balkan markets. But actually even countries like Hungary and all the Balkan countries, including Serbia, there's like this local interest which count in millions. But what's happening now with Russia being really busy, they have these local operatives which are relatively their own agencies. But the bigger story actually happens through Turkey. And I think the key question will be what will happen with the gas and oil, sort of the entire market that will go through Turkey proper, and how all these small, in a large scale for Europe, all these small gas or oil pipelines or deals will play into the big role, because this is also the way how Western Europe may sort out its own dependency on Russia in the future. And why this is important? It's important because also when you see Vucic and, and Orban meeting and making all these linkages uh, about oil and, 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 and gas, it's important because actually none of the small countries, and in this case I, I would even add Hungary to it, cannot protect itself and cannot think on the energy market. So, and, I, and that's why actually I think we should start looking as well at the bigger picture and all of these smaller pieces of the puzzle may give us uh, uh, some hints of what's happening as well at the level of, of Turkey because that will be the fight for billions and the Western Balkans will, will have it. And, and I leave it there because we should have mentioned also Turkey in this conversation when we talk about the Western Balkans. Again, so many things to talk about. Don't put that down. I have a quick follow-up for you. You or Ziga, or both of you, if you had to, you know, the, the Western Balkans have the longest uh, experience with EU integration um, of any country that hopefully wants to become a member. I mean, because countries that are members had much shorter integration processes. What if you could come up with three things that you know were learned the hard way in the Balkans, um, that Ukraine and Moldova, um, maybe Georgia, um, could uh, consider in in their you know could not could not uh, should not repeat except for hiring our experts. The worst lesson is that it doesn't pay off to be a democrat. Don't ask me. Ask uh, Ask Zaev, the former prime minister of Macedonia because he delivered on everything and he got nothing in return. And, and actually the bad lesson was that Vucic could gloat publicly, first privately, then publicly and say, where are your democratic credentials? It's a very important thing. And, and I think it cannot be repeated because Ukraine has a very weird leverage, but a very tangible leverage over European Union, which is not a bad news. But in principle, uh, I, I think we really have, you know, the values that are really talked about have to be practiced. Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, Giga talked about the, uh, the uh, various modalities. Obviously, Ukraine and Moldova will have to have a different modality of negotiation. It's impossible. But when I'm seeing that this is the, the, you know, the city of Munich will never become a member of the European Union. That's actually how people in Berlin think. Why shall we give six slots where actually we don't give even a slot to Bavaria, which is like, a, you know, will be probably bigger than half of the EU members. And I think we really have to think about not only how this is square in terms of governance, but actually where you put the, because also this is a bit condescending just in economic parameter stock, which are important, but not the only ones. And I think we have to also think in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, from the aspect of capacity, because these countries are too small to basically pull off 100,000 pages and counting of a key, unless they do copy pasting uh, uh, exercise. And that's never a good thing when you have to organize your life and your economy on, uh, on copy paste. Shika, quickly. All right, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, no, I just have to follow up on what uh, Gordon said. Exactly the worst thing that uh, actually happened in the Western Balkans in the past few years was exactly the situation in North Macedonia. North Macedonian government, you know, after the ousting of Groeski really speeded up the process and did you know, got nothing in return. And this cannot be repeated by the EU, otherwise really we have to wrap up the whole enlargement policy and stop. And 
can't so win. So Ukraine shouldn't compromise? No, uh, and I think that's invisible that actually Ukraine, unlike the Western Balkan leaders, knows how to push the West to get what they want. I mean, it's also I mean, it's a bigger country, conflict. it's a different situation, obviously, but their diplomatic efforts are incredible. They know what they want and they go for it. And you know, that's uh, in comparison to looking into the situ situation of Serbia. I mean, currently, I don't see that Serbia could actually join the EU anyhow, because they will never reform in the line of what is expected from them. Because if they do, if they have independent judiciary, what happens to Vucic? Well, he goes to trial. You know, why would he be doing that? Isn't Serbia the front runner, though, for EU integration? <laughs> well, yeah, on paper. Uh, well, with Montenegro, Serbia. You know, Montenegro closed down more chapters asylum, than asylum, Serbia, asylum but... Asylum is an option. Ask uh, in Hungary, right, uh, yeah. Hungary, he's on Roja Domp, uh, three kilometers from here. Uh, greetings to Gruevski. <laughs> Tanya, again, very briefly before I open to questions so everyone can prepare, I think I have time, uh, the other panel started later, so I'm counting in for exactly an hour um, with everything, but Tanya, briefly, um, one thing that Bosnia knows better than any country in Europe, I think, is trying to cover for the rights of ethnic, linguistic, religious groups. And, you know, Ukraine, if it goes through the European integration process, will have to have protections in place for um, it's very, uh, varied groups. How would you, uh, because the EU requires it, how would you, what tips would you give in terms of that? Uh, you know, think, mistakes that shouldn't be repeated that were made in Bosnia. That, that's a really good question. I would just <laughs> brief comment on the previous, and of course comments if you have yeah, them. Brief, brief comment on the what Ukraine and Moldova can learn from you know Western Balkans. I would actually reverse the question and say what can EU learn from the kind of failed accession process in the Western Balkans because. Um, the the appetite for the EU enlargement is there. Like when you when you take a look at the data, four years ago the numbers were a little, a little bit startlingly worse. Now they're not bad. So like, what can EU actually derive from there? Um, uh, which brings me also to the point when you you know Ukraine submitting the questionnaire in a record time. They had technical assistance. Bosnia did not. So like. The EU has to also proactively step up and 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 kind of. Um, uh, walk the talk if the EU enlargement is a, a foreign policy credo. Uh, back to Bosnia. Look, I mean, <laughs> to be completely frank, uh, Bosnia is still governed by the constitution that is a part of a peace agreement that was a perfect military cease, you know, ceasefire. But, but maybe, again, I'm not putting anything or f uh, out there, but maybe that might be a situation that Ukraine might have to face and or exactly, something along those lines. Exactly. Going, go, going back to that. So, like, the, the peace agreement signed in Dayton, DPA, 95, ended the military conflict in Bosnia. However, uh, one, so one of the annexes of the Annex 5 is actually the constitution of the country. However, um, what the military leaders at the time and, and the international community did not think at the time was uh, provisions to uh, actually amend the constitution. And now we're stuck with a perfectly uh, drafted military document that ended the, you know, the fire and ended the, the conflict, but it actually uh, kind of disabled the country at the same time um, uh, 30 years after. So provisions to you know modify constitution when needed, um, uh, provisions to um, uh, build in some of the uh, power sharing mechanisms that are uh, effective and and, and 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 useful. I think that would be that would be one of the one of the ways forward. But I'm I, looking at the engagement of the Ukrainian civil society that is at the front line of this, uh, criticizing and scrutinizing the government as they are in the war is absolutely amazing. And I'm I'm personally inspired by the work of the Ukrainian civil society and, and, and the media. Do you have comments before you open qu to yeah, questions? Uh, I wanted to say and actually follow up on something that was already said, uh, that in my opinion, um, among many other decisions or policies that uh, the EU could enact in, uh, in the Western Balkans, one thing is crucial is that there is not enough EU stratcom in Serbia. Um, I remember uh, several, a few years ago, you remember there was this COVID-19 pandemic, and I was looking at how Russia was trying to weaponize the pandemic in order to advance its foreign policy interests. I was looking at Italy. If you remember, there were, there were these convoys of Russian trucks with so-called aid uh, to Italy, but I was also looking at what it was doing in Serbia. It tried the same thing uh, together with China, uh, but 
what I'm trying to say here is that there was a public opinion poll among, um, in, in Serbia, among the population, and uh, Serbs were asked who, what country, in their opinion, was doing the most to help Serbia with the, with the COVID-19 related aid. And the, the numbers or the percentage, what they thought who was, it was China and Russia. And that was, it was the opposite of truth. Because the EU did so much more for Serbia than China or Russia, but in the public perceptions, that was Russia and China that were uh, doing much better. So, you need to be present, you know, uh, as the joke goes, we do not do propaganda, yeah, it's Stratcom what we do. There is not enough EU Stratcom, there is not enough explanations from the EU side how much the EU has already invested in, in the region. And, uh, and in many cases, the, uh, this, some economic successes uh, that they have, they have those not, bef not because of, of China, or, or, or Russia, but because of the EU. I'll stop here. Anton, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm being signaled right, left, and center. Stop. But can I take two questions? It'd be so unfair. Um, rapid fire. Anyone? Questions? No questions. Okay, then Jiga, do follow up. I just wanted to quickly follow up on this, uh, you know, Stratcom idea. And really, I mean, when we talk about the influence of Russia or China, especially in Serbia, it's not built on rational thinking. If you would ask Serb, pro-Russian stands, you know, where would they send their kids to school? Russia or EU? They would always say EU. You know, would they buy Russian milk or EU milk from Germany, for example? They would buy the German one. It's just this emotional sentiment and this myth that actually Russia is the big brother, which was kind of built up by also the propaganda of the government. It's, you know, if we look at the historic facts, you know, I don't think Russia is really a big brother, but it plays well in the cards of the government. And with that, I think we can wrap up. Uh... I was signaled something. Wrap up. I thank you so much, everyone, for trying to cover so many different bases. I think, like I said, this is their entire conference is devo devoted to this topic, not you know merely panels. But there was a valiant effort by everyone to cover so much. Thank you again. I think everyone deserves an, uh, a round of applause. And of course, I um, I encourage you to reach out to the speakers personally if you have additional questions. Thank you.